Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm Dick Samuels, and I direct the Center for International Studies uh, at MIT, where our very dear friend and our colleague and Coco's author, uh, John Tierman, uh, worked for 18 productive and very creative years. Uh, and I want to thank everyone very much for coming, uh, for coming this morning to join us in remembering him. It's, it's clear, it was clear to all of us who worked on a daily basis with John that he, he was ill um, uh, these past few years. But as everyone who did work with him will attest, uh, he never once whined about it. That wasn't his style. Uh, he had better things to do. He had programs to create. He had projects to complete. He had books to write, and he accomplished a great many of all of these things along the way. And as, as I'm sure you know, he served as, as uh, associate director of the center for nearly two decades and was ever uh, a very vigorous and very thoughtful, but always very modest leader of a great many of the center's initiatives during that time. I can't count uh, the number of projects that he helped pilot, and that's not just because there were so many, but also because they were of so many different varieties. Uh, he, was, he was easy to underestimate, John was, um, because he never bloviated. That is, he, he never blathered on ever about his achievements. Uh, but there were so many, so very many uh, achievements. Uh, and so one underestimated uh, his, his intellect and his contributions at their, own, at their own loss. And I know the standard locution for, for it would be underestimated one's peril, but peril and Tierman uh, never belong in the, same, in the same sentence. The fact is, he was broader and he was deeper and he was certainly more productive uh, than, than most. Uh, at, at the core of his intellectual uh, agenda was his deeply anchored humanism. He worked at the intersection of human security and international affairs, and as he put it, he cared most deeply about the consequences of, of war for innocent people caught in the conflict. Why, he wondered, why, on his Amazon bio page, uh, did so many civilians suffer in war, and why did we do so little about it? And as if that weren't enough, a big enough central question to animate a life's work, um, there was so much more he worked on, including the suffering of ordinary people in peacetime. He worked on resilient cities. He worked on migration. He addressed discrimination. He wrote about the relationship of private wealth to public power. And as many of you know very well, he never, ever shirked uh, from calling out governments and those working in governments uh, who deserve to be called out. Uh, because, of, because the issue of, of, of uh, Israel-Palestine was uh, so uncomfortably ambiguous regarding war and peace, um, and certainly because it was the deepest dive that we ever took together, uh, my favorite collaboration with John was the Just Jerusalem project um, that we undertook with our colleagues in urban studies and planning and in the School of Architecture. Um, in the, in the architecture department. Designing that project with him and with them, uh, and some of the colleagues who couldn't be here, but we, wish, we, we know they wish they were, uh, Diane Davis and, and Bish Sanyal and others. Um, uh, we all, oh, Diane, thanks for coming. That's a nice surprise. Um, uh, we all miss him, and we, we miss our other colleagues who have passed from the architecture department, the deans, you know, uh, Bill Mitchell and Jean de Monchot. Uh, and it was, working with them was just simply a joy uh, for John and, and uh, for all of us. And, and just Jerusalem pivoted off of a, of a straightforward inquiry, which is how best might we imagine uh, Jerusalem as a city becoming a stable, prosperous, safe place for all its inhabitants by 2050? It's a good, it's a good question. Um, and to facilitate the, gener the generation of good ideas and, and solutions, 
uh, to the many problems and, and roadblocks uh, along the way. The project set up an interdisciplinary, web-based, juried design competition. Uh, and the imaginings, the imaginings that it generated on the world, from the World Wide Web at the time, it was known as, it, it, those imaginings flowed in thick, refreshing torrents from all across the world. All the entrance submissions were judged blindly, that is, as, as you know, without any identification. The, the jurors didn't know whose work they were judging. Um, and it was a distinguished group of jurors, and the winner uh, was, was a project that was submitted uh, to our delight by a group of undergraduates from Miami University in Ohio. Uh, it's not where we would have expected uh, the winners to come, and we were delighted that it did, and their prize was to spend a year working with folks in urban studies and planning and architecture and at, through the Center uh, for International Studies. And John and I often, uh, and always in a melancholy way, uh, since the stability, the prosperity, and the safety that so many of the participants and entrants into the competition had hoped would begin to emerge has proven so elusive for so long. Now, in addition to managing or co-managing a raft of other important projects like the Human Rights and Technology Fellowship Program with Anat Beletsky, who Anat Beletsky, I know she's here, uh, who we'll hear from in a moment. Uh, she was also a Just Jerusalem alum. Uh, the Human Security Dashboard, his Persian Gulf Initiative, we'll hear about that. The Wiener, Myron Wiener Migration Seminar. Uh, our half-day seminar for the Boston Consul's General uh, we, which we did on a, on a biannual basis. Uh, John managed to, publish, to do those things and then to publish book uh, after important book, each of which uh, attracted respect for its gravity and for its insights. Um, most of you are familiar with his 2011 Death of Others, The Fate of Civilians in America's Wars. I hope you'll become familiar with his more recent one. Actually, we'll hear more about it from us uh, as we go on this morning, um, which was published just just before his death. Now, it's, it, it was a habit of mine to wander uh, into his office to kvetch uh, when I had a writing problem and, and to get his take on, you know, what I should read. Where should I look to solve, to solve, to understand this better? And the best lead he ever gave me was a book where I know I never would have read or come to even hear about otherwise. It was a book by a fellow named, a historian, distinguished historian, as it turned out, named Richard Slotkin, um, on how 17th century Puritan preachers in New England built an American identity by appealing uh, to their congregants' fears of abduction by savage, quote unquote, others. Um, and it's a trope that persists to this day. Uh, we see it, we, we, we hear about it every night on the news, but learning uh, about its origins through this recommendation by John transformed the way uh, I thought about a project that I was doing on political captivity, uh, and through that recommendation, he, re he redirected my inquiry uh, toward more fertile and productive ground than I had imagined tilling until that point. Now, in our business, this is the best that colleagues provide. This is the best that colleagues do for, for one another. Um, and he did it regularly. Um, he was an exemplary colleague in every sense, and it was an enormous privilege uh, to have him in our midst for as long as we did. Oh, and there's one more thing. One more thing. We all have hobbies. Uh, now, now, some people collect antiquarian books, and some people collect stamps or coins. Um, still others, you know, they, they spend their time when, when they get leisure time, sport, doing sports, fishing. Um, some do volunteer work. There's all sorts of things, ways to keep ourselves occupied. John's hobby may be was a bit unusual. Um, he, he, he loved the ponies. And, and uh, please have a look at the wonderful, is, is, where's Alan? Is Alan Bergen? Alan, thank you. Thanks for coming. Um, have, a, have a look at the tribute that his good friend Alan Berger uh, has, has provided. He's here with us today and he, he recalls their time together sneaking away from a conference in Moscow uh, to check out the local racetrack. And so I'm going to read, with Alan's permission, um, from Alan's note, but maybe you've already seen it, it's been posted up. Uh, read it again, it's just, it's rich. Um, is it, 
Alan's words, we found ourselves among a polyglot crowd of Soviet citizens passionately debating speed and class for the Daily Double. There were Georgians and Kazakhs, Armenians, Chechens, and handicappers from many other ethnic groups in that great Soviet prison house of nations. We may not have understood their disparate tongues, but we had a pretty sound understanding of the sorts of debates they were having. And at one point, John turned to me with a sardonic, to Alan, uh, with a sardonic smile and said, you realize, don't you, that there's not a single Marxist in this entire, in this entire place? <laughs> and we then speculated on, on how much time was left for that imploding Soviet state. And we thought we had learned something that the best informed analysts at CIA uh, would not grasp for another year and a half. So thank you for letting me read that, Alan. I'm not taking credit, clearly, and I don't deserve it. Um, John even hit a trifecta last year. Uh, but true to form, I had to ask him innocently, did you ever bet on a trifecta? Yeah, I, I, don't, know. I don't know much about the ponies. Um, uh, and so I had to ask him to learn that he had hit a trifecta just that past summer. So look, rumors, now they're, they're just rumors, mind you, uh, were that he hoped to have his ashes, ashes scattered surreptitiously on the Saratoga uh, racetrack. Uh, I don't know, we, we can check and, and find out if, it, if there's any truth in it, but look, it, I'm gonna end. It, it's a cliche. Uh, it's a cliche, but it needs to be said nonetheless because John was just simply so wonderful to work with, uh, so grounded and always such a positive member of, of what we like to think of as our merry band at the center. So it, it is a cliche, but he's already very dearly missed. Good morning to you all. Um, first, I want to thank uh, Professor Samuels and Ms. English for giving me this opportunity to say a few words, um, a tribute uh, to my uh, good and wonderful friend, uh, John Tierman. I met and got to know John in the late 1980s. He was still a young man um, in those days, in his late 30s. 
He was the program director at the Social Science um, Research Council, uh, where Myron Wiener and I chaired two separate um, area studies committees, one on South Asia and the other on the Middle East. John's interests at the time were focused primarily on much broader issues, international relations, security, and the human costs of war, as Professor Samuels just uh, mentioned, rather than on area studies or on any particular world region. I remember at the time, Myron and I were organizing a small team of senior MIT faculty, some of them here today, and one or two outsider uh, experts um, through the CIS and funded by AID and full backing of the US government at that time to travel to Pakistan and Afghanistan to observe the ravages of the war of resistance against the Soviet Union, the plight of the millions of Afghan refugees, and to prepare a modest mini Marshall Plan for the reconstruction of Afghanistan after the Soviet withdrawal. The CIS team visited Pakistan and Afghanistan, met with all the key officials and former combatants in the region, and prepared a set of modest proposals for post-war reconstruction. But unfortunately, our government had lost all interests in playing any such role in Afghanistan, despite the fact that we had spent hundreds of millions of dollars during the final years of the Soviet occupation to support the Mujahideen fighters, who, as you remember, some of you at least, they were referred to as freedom fighters at the time. John, read the CIS's report and our recommendations with great interest back in 1991 and was very supportive of our efforts. At that time, he had no connection to uh, MIT. And perhaps, and this is my judgment, perhaps this may have helped draw his attention to the conflicts in that part of the world, that is South, West Asia, and the Middle East. Soon after taking the executive directorship of the center in 2004, as many of you remember, he organized a conference and initiated a multi-year project to assess the consequences of US's 2003 invasion of Iraq and more generally US policies towards the Persian Gulf and Iran. The participants in the project included senior diplomats like Thomas Pickering, Bruce Rydell, Barbara Bodine, as well as leading US and regional scholars. This was a prelude to uh, John's later and more extensive studies of US-Iran relations with Malcolm Byrne and Hossein Banai at the center. And I'm sure our keynote speaker um, Dr. Banai um, will say more about that. John was far more than a dedicated and uniquely capable administrator. He was a scholar with a deep and unswerving commitment to human rights, justice, and the pursuit of peace. A distinctive hallmark of his later writings on conflict resolution was the emphasis that he placed uh, on the need to understand the Weltanschauungen and the dominant political narratives, not only of our adversaries, but also our own. John was a dear and inspiring friend to many of us gathered here today. His warmth, generosity, and humility were proverbial. My last get together with John was for lunch at the Charles Hotel a few days before his untimely passing. We spent nearly three hours until we were asked by the head waiter to leave our table. 
planning a projected CIA-sponsored conference to provide a critical retrospective on the 20-year U.S. war in Afghanistan. This was, of course, the very subject that had brought us together some 30 years um, earlier. I'd like to end my tribute to John with a few lines from a contemporary poet, Persian poet, that I think expresses my feelings about my dear friend John much better than I can do in my own words. And here's the poem. Times will pass and the sun shall shine forever. Times will pass and the sun shall shine forever. They say a learned sage, like our friend John Tierman, lacks two dates. When he entered the world, and when he left it. Yes, he entered our world at some point and departed it at another, but he shall remain eternally in our hearts and minds. Thank you so much. Hello. What can I say? I see faces here that make me start crying, so I'll try not to. All I need to do, all anyone needs to do, is just read those tributes. And Dick started that. It would be very easy to just read those tributes and pretend or purport to know who John was and what he meant to so many people. Um, when I read those tributes, I just stopped in my track. And I think someone reading that who hadn't known John would say, could that be true? Can there really be a person like that? Is this obituary style a hyperbole? Just reading it, you then think to yourself, if it's you or I reading those words, and since we knew John, you find yourself nodding in total agreement to everything that was said there, smiling often in immediate recognition, weeping at the terrible loss. And you say to yourself, I said to myself, I guess Dick said to himself, why not just read out of there choose the things that really mean something to you personally, well, Dick has stolen some of mine. But word for word, one-on-one, -on -one, you can easily talk about John eloquently. And there's an interesting, contra not contradiction, paradox there between the eloquence and the type of deep quiet that one gets, one got from John. So instead of taking the easy way out and choosing, and not that you took an easy way out, <laughs> you chose Alan's words, um, but choosing two points that meant so much to me with and from John. One is humanism, and the other is Israel-Palestine. And that's why I say that. Dick has said not all of it. I'll just emphasize those two things. And when I say humanism, it's both the theoretical ism that we all know about. Some of us are supposed to be post-humanists now, right? There's all sorts of things going on with humanism. But I mean the humanity also that John stood for. Um, if you think about his books, just think of the titles, all of them, and the human shines through. 
They all tell the tale, the essential tale, of the human suffering and human costs and human pain and human deaths and human rights, always there in all of our political dealings. I knew of the books that had come out before I met John, but then in 2011, when Deaths of Others was published, with the elaboration in the subtitle about fate of civilians in America's wars, at least in the human rights and humanitarian community, you couldn't talk about anything else for a long time. And I remember getting the book, and as usual with his books, when I got to his office a day later, he had a copy for me, and I always said to him, Amazon does it better. <laughs> and then after that, of course, there was Becoming Enemies, Dream Chasers, and then the book that just came out now, and one of the last events we had was about that book, Republics of Myth. The humanism of those projects is an insistence on looking through actions and texts and policies, and sorry, most important for me, ideas. But looking through that for the human facets, and I think that is what created the deep camaraderie that transcended any academic or even political interest that we shared. And that care for humanity carried through to the program that I did with him, that Dick and John invited me into, human rights and technology. Every time we met, and that was often about the program, he would chuckle, saying that this sounded like gossip. And it was his way, I thought, of being diffident, of not acknowledging that we were talking about something that was at the top of the world. So it was gossip. But the second point, not humanism, is Israel-Palestine. When I came to CIS as a human rights fellow in 2007, it was explicitly to work on challenges wrought by the human rights situation in Palestine, Israel, explicitly on the questions of Palestinian human rights. And I had the amazing fortune of quickly being made a part of the Jerusalem, Just Jerusalem contest. And I even got the recognition of saying what I wanted to say subjectively, not objective academic work, subjectively. The winners of the contest, and, and I remembered a little differently, but the winners of the contest received the prize of spending time at MIT but John and Dick gave me the prize of teaching them a human rights course. And you can't imagine that kind of work with John always there in all the classes. Also that year, no, probably a year, no, that year, in 2007, John continued to always talk about the Palestinian tragedy. He thought of it almost as a case of personal woe. He mentioned in his excitement having a star form on Walt Mearsheimer's book. I think that was probably the first event that I was ever at here. Um, he never stopped talking during the years afterwards about the amazing, I think it was called, I don't even remember, um, 70 years, no, it wasn't called 70 years, that was a different one. Um, Harvard, MIT, or was it MIT, Harvard, Gaza Symposium? At least that's how I have it down in my notes. Two or three days of people at Harvard, at MIT, many speakers who came from abroad, from Lebanon, from France, from UK. And John kept reminding me of things that people said there. But then fast forward to the recent 70 years Israel-Palestine Reflections and Forecasts, where again, under John's initiative, the Palestinian issue was the center of things. He never set it aside, and never did he begrudge me my own obsession with that tragedy. I want to say that it became his obsession too, especially during this last year when news stories from Palestine-Israel took a certain very definitive turn. 
John thought that CIS should have a conference on settler violence, as he called it. That was the subject that he wanted the conference to be about. We talked it over, we brought Michelle into the planning, discussing the idea, the title, the structure of the event, the panelists. Our discussion started always with a familiar pattern. I would say, let's add a panel on the concept of apartheid. Let's talk about the Israeli military support for settlers. Let's include the issue of Palestinian citizens of Israel. Let's talk about state violence. And John would quietly but adamantly say, only settler violence. And I thought about that a lot, even before these tragic days. He couldn't get it out of his head. He couldn't get over it. His humanism couldn't overcome the inconceivability, the travesty to humanity wrought by settler violence in Palestine. His last email to me said, when are we going to finalize the speakers for settler violence? Not for the settler violence conference, for settler violence. When are we going to finalize? So a final short personal note again. I knew that this week, ending on November 4th, would be John's memorial. I knew also that this week would hold elections in Israel. I didn't know, though I and many others had good reasons to shake in trepidation, that these elections would end with the greatest imaginable victory in history for Jewish settlers in Palestine, Israel. Just a coincidence, I know, November 1st, November 4th but it makes John's memory so tangible for me. I can see his wry smile, his gentle prodding, his modest insistence that we continue to work on and for humanity as he did, and I hope we can. Thank you. Good morning. I 
I'd like to begin by thanking uh, John CI's colleagues, especially Richard Samuels and Michelle English, and for having so gracefully and lovingly honored John's memory and his contributions and legacy since his untimely passing on August 19th and culminating in today's service. I know John would have been enormously uh, moved if a tad bit embarrassed by all the attention directed at his way. He genuinely and unreservedly loved his MIT family and it had become a joke among uh, some of us, his colleagues, uh, that he never had anything negative to say <laughs> about MIT um, departmental intrigue. I should also like to acknowledge and express my utmost gratitude for the enormous privilege uh, you've given me as the keynote speaker in the program uh, to the extent that I deserve any designation in relation to John's um, in, in my relationship with, with John, surely eternally grateful mentee would be the most appropriate. And it's in this spirit that I like to um, reflect on his memory. I first met John, uh, as I also did uh, Ali Bano Azizi, uh, my good friend Malcolm Byrne and Kurt Fent, um, in a most majestic of settings at the Rockefeller Foundation's heavenly Bellagio Conference Center on Lake Como in Italy. <clears throat> Whenever someone asked uh, how we knew each other, John would say that we met under the banner of heaven in Bellagio. I was then a lowly graduate student at Brown, specializing in political theory and international relations with a focus on the development of political thought in modern Iran. John Malcolm and our mutual uh, friends, Jim Blight and Janet Lang, um, were the co-conveners of a new critical oral history workshop on U.S.-Iran relations, which was a uniquely exciting approach to examining the sources and patterns of enmity between Iran and the United States since the 1979 revolution, which resulted in a number of collaborations between us, the last of which was the book that has been mentioned, Republics of Myth, that came out in April, and which um, John Malcolm and I had a great deal of plans um, promoting over the course of this fall. I was added somewhat belatedly to the project on sheer blind faith that perhaps by dint of my upbringing in post-revolutionary Iran and nascent scholarly interest in its political history, I could be of assistance in scrutinizing and translating Persian language primary sources and even act as a semi-scout in vetting prospective participants, Iranian participants, in the workshops. On my arrival in Bellagio, John greeted me warmly, but understandably, understandably somewhat distantly. As the workshop got underway, he opened the proceedings in his low voice um, and characteristic sardonic tone. A few of the Iranian participants had unexpectedly dropped out last minute. John was not happy about this because they did not have convincing excuses. Of all the organizers, he was most visibly irritated and made clear so in his opening remarks to the rest of the attendees. As I observed his continued discomfort throughout the first session, I decided to approach him during the first break on the conference room balcony overlooking the most breathtaking vista. Still looking glum, John turned to me and asked, so what do you think? Somewhat earnestly, I said, I'd say a two and a half to one ratio of scholars to policymakers isn't exactly good, especially for whoever's paying for this. His eyes immediately lit up and a hint of a smile appeared on his face as he stared at me for an awkward 10 to 15 seconds, nodding. But he turned his back toward the vista and said, I meant what do you think of the view, young man? <laughs> but but good to know about your priorities. And we were off to a good start from then on. That night in my room, as I feverishly Googled and combed the academic internet about all things related to John Tierman, I recorded my first impressions in my diary. JT, clearly in charge, serious but gentle, thoughtful, mercurial, kind, much to learn. 
Much to learn from, indeed. Shortly after Bellagio, John asked if I'd like to become an affiliate at CIS and also a co-convener of the US-Iran project. I eagerly accepted, who wouldn't, as a graduate student. And since at the time I lived in Providence, we also made a habit of weekly lunch meetings in Cambridge and Providence. Meetings would always begin with a family check-in, updates on Coco, Nikki, assorted cats, ponies, my partner Tracy and her burgeoning medical career, my family in Toronto, as John called Toronto, where my parents lived, our immediate plans and so on. We then, or I should say he, John, would turn to my work. Where was I on research, writing, plans for publishing? Have I read the recent work by so-and-so? When am I going to send the next chapter of my work? What do I think of so-and-so? And always, what's the point behind so-and-so's and by implication, my own work? These lunches, always arranged and paid for by John, were a most rigorous form of education for me, which happened in parallel to my formal education at Brown. In the course of extended conversations on a seemingly boundless range of topics covering the failure of Tanzimat reforms in late Ottoman Turkey, the follies of Wilsonian idealism, observations from the world of horse racing, a perennial obsession of his, as we've heard, our mutual admiration for Eric Hobsbawm, Hannah Arendt, Isaiah Berlin, Hilary Mantel, John's mentor, Howard Zinn. He always had a Howard Zinn story in his back pocket. The latest literary trends, political scandals, gossip, always from my side, never from his. In the course of our hours-long conversations about all these topics, always based on pre-assigned readings by John, he would carefully pierce through my well-armed sophomoric intellectualism and set me straight. But he would do this through the simple device of listening intently and seriously, so that I had to, uh, and seriously to what I had to say, ask exacting questions, and then gently picking apart the deficits in my assumptions in a manner I could both accept and respect. As a mentor, John represented the best of liberal education, good faith engagement, rigorous reasoning, generosity of spirit, reflective understanding, respectful dialogue. Indeed, to paraphrase the late Tony Judd, whom we both tremendously admired, as he wrote of his incomparable menteeship experience in 1960s Cambridge, I have never lost the sense that this was learning, wit, range, and above all, the ability to connect. No doubt it helped tremendously that by and large we shared the same moral and political intuitions as he called it upper middle left denizens of the academy. Although he liked my flagpole analogy better, that is our politics resembled a patchwork flag aloft and susceptible to winds, but always at half mast. Above all, he hated dogmatism. Once in 2013 at Occidental College, where I had my first tenure track job, on a trip to promote his most hauntingly important book, I think, The Deaths of Others, I walked John to an outdoor art installation of an American military drone constructed entirely out of the mud used in the Afghan and Pakistani homes on which Hellfire missiles were routinely raining down in the Obama years. John was elated at the sight of this evocative piece of protest art, protest art on the very spot a young, precocious Barack Obama had once protested American support for the apartheid regime in South Africa. But as one of my students started to hurl a litany of well-worn invectives at Obama and the Democrats as being indistinguishable from Bush and the Republicans, John reflexively but gently asked the student, Tell me, what do you know about the number of dead Afghans, Pakistanis, Yemenis, or indeed anything about them? What do you know about the histories of these places? As the student hemmed and hawed with unease, John implored him to be equally curious about the empirics on the civilian side. He then pulled a copy of his book out of his bag, signed it, and gave it to the student. The student was grateful for this gesture, went on to become a senior person at Amnesty International and would routinely send me notes about that very formative moment in his education with John. Blind, dogmatic rage, 
he told the student, makes for cheap criticism, let alone lead to constructive action. In dishing out lessons, he could be equally mischievous. After my wife and I got recruited to move to Indiana University, his alma mater, uh, the circle having come uh, fully around, I invited John out for a campus talk to IU. Before his talk, we decided to go for a walking, in, walking inspection of the campus to see what had changed or remained the same. As we rounded the beautiful arboretum on our way to the library, we ran into a family clearly separated from their assigned campus group uh, on a tour. Excited by the sight of ostensible IU faculty who could point them in the right direction, the father proudly adorning a Reagan Bush 84 vintage campaign t-shirt approached John to ask for directions. Without missing a beat, John said, all I can tell you is that this is an excellent spot to drop acid. <laughs> and for fornication, you might want to consider that wall behind the library exit. <laughs> Horrified and in utter disbelief, the family rather briskly walked away. I too was in shock and speechless. John turned to me with a smile on his face, a big boyish smile on his face, and deadpanned, you're welcome. <laughs> this mixture of serious and mischievous attitude toward what he regarded as unthinking behavior was the intellectual spirit that guided John's lucid, productive, engaging, rigorous scholarship and non-academic writing throughout his career. John fundamentally believed in the mutual constitution of morality and politics, of realism and idealism, of criticism and hope, of humor and righteous indignation. And he was despairing of any representations, be it in academia, in journalism, or in the policy world, that reduce these complex relationships into false binaries. Above all, as many of the wonderful tributes to him have observed since his passing, he was a partisan of equal respect for persons, of serving the public interest, of integrity, peace, and justice. His written body of works reflect these affinities across a range of topics, and it must be said, impressively versatile and always beautifully composed forms of writing. It would easily take me the remainder of today and perhaps the weekend to list and ruminate on all of John's important interventions on these topics, um, that are covered in his books and much more. So instead, I want to spend a few moments on what I take to be the work most representative of his intellectual rigors and moral commitments, the deaths of others, the fate of civilians in America's wars, which was published in 2011. The book followed John's commissioning of the Iraq mortality study that was published in The Lancet in October 2006, the study, which was controversial at the time because of its high estimates of total excess deaths attributable to the war, approximately 650,000, was carried out by scientists at the Johns Hopkins School of Public Health and in Iraq. John very much anticipated the official Washington establishment, uh, Washington establishment and media responses to this study, which were a mixture of vicious incredulity and bad faith denialism. More distressing was the public response, silence. He was a major, here was a major scientific attempt, minor imperfections and all, at approximating the number of civilian deaths made partially possible by our tax dollars, and yet such deafening silence. What explained this public shrug to avoidable human suffering? The deaths of others took up this question in the cases of US interventions in Korea, in the China, Afghanistan, and Iraq. The book best illuminates John's lifelong commitment to understanding what he calls evocatively, the fortress of indifference. Indeed, this is the moral concern running through nearly all of his works, a preoccupation with the sources behind and the construction of indifference in global, but especially American politics. As he says in the book, and I quote here, the dead of war have something to tell us. The way that wars are fought leaves a signature, 
a pattern of destruction on the societies where they occur. The war makers on all sides tend to mirror this pattern, but their impact varies. Those with a certain kind of hammer, say fighter bombers or long-range long artillery, will see that nail of warfare differently from those who possess only punji sticks or IEDs. Those who are defending their homeland will use the tools of war differently from those who are invading, and the war itself will shape the tactics and the numbers who will take up arms. The deaths of many of our villagers, of your villagers, affect your sensibilities about the conflict differently from the death of a neighbor fighting in an army far away. It will alter your perceptions about safety and who is protecting you, with whom sh to share your sense of insecurity and need to react, how to align your life to attempt to ensure that an attack does not happen again, fight or flee. Just as the numbers of displaced paint a portrait of the conflict, so too will the numbers of dead and how they died. This is what General William Tecumseh Sherman called the epistemology of war. In the case of the US, a system of knowledge has evolved that permits this very partial perspective. It is not intentional for the most part, but the result of four centuries of national expansion that would have been impossible were its consequences for the natives a guiding moral concern. The fate of the natives is effectively excluded from the discourse of war. It may be considered many years later as it has with Native Americans, though without restitution. But the system of knowledge in war time disallows, in effect, a serious and sustained effort, a politically consequential effort to regard the human costs. It is impermissible, not only because it muddies war aims and war's conduct, or because it's contentious, or because, but because it challenges fundamentally American self-regard, our mission, our place as the city on a hill. He concludes, it may be that the turning away from carnage is too ingrained in human nature to provide us with new perspectives. Until we try, we won't know. Until we try, we won't know. Remember those pleading, hopeful words born of everyday moral experiences from John's own rich life. He more than tried in his scholarship, his public writings, his institutional and philanthropic roles, and his personal relationships. John's moral exhortations are not only evident in his writings, but also radiate through his ever attentive labors to connect people, empower fledgling minds, spotlight overlooked contributions, and always do what he could to secure resources and funding for work he found to be trying hard. He was not indifferent to the contingent cruelties that may have upended once promising career trajectories of refugees, dissidents, and the displaced the world over. As an orphan adopted by loving parents from South Bend, Indiana, he understood the intricate ties between chance and vulnerability. As he often would sweetly reflect on Twitter every Father's Day and Mother's Day, it's the hardest part. <laughs> Were it not for the interest, care, and love shown him by his parents, his own life trajectory may well have been very different. Until we try, we won't know. They, his parents, tried and the rest of us got to know. A compassionate soul, a diligent mind, a beautiful writer, a devoted and caring friend, a loving, proud father who was never happier or more radiant than when he talked about his beloved Coco. John hated excessive praise. He would tell me, whenever you hear excessive praise, something has terribly gone wrong. <laughs> well, something has gone terribly wrong. We've lost an enormous force for good in the world in the passing of our dear friend and mentor, John Tierman.
It's so great that everybody is here, and thanks to Dick and Michelle for amazing organizing. I'll be brief. I just want to linger for a moment to savor the memory of this friend of all of ours, John Tierman. Can't you remember how he would say, well, you see, it depends, or I've been thinking in that voice, so gravelly, so deep, so soft. I remember John as a place, like Dick, his dark office, often with no overhead lights on. I felt so welcome there. I'm a historian, I'm not an IR person, I'm not a political scientist, I don't do security studies in the classical sense, but he brought me in, he made me feel welcomed. Um, I, and I knew that I, could, I was welcome there. I could stop by any time, and I did. I could ask his advice. I could, even though I knew I was taking him away from his writing, his other important projects, he never said that. He never made me feel like he was too busy. I remember John as a time of day, our lunches, at least once a semester at the Kendall Hotel or at Legal Seafood, where we would catch up on current politics, on how his daughter was doing, how he was transporting her to, so that he could have a chance to see more of Coco. He would tell me about Iran or Cuba. He would ask, I would ask his advice about speakers to bring to MIT or fundraising for my many, many MISTI projects or how to interview people in historic projects. I remember John as a brief joint project. We had an idea to make a human security reading group, which we did uh, for a year in 2011, to talk about security and the well-being of communities, how to be free from violence and threat of harm, how to advance food security and health justice and environmental um, suitability, sustainability. I remember how he supported Diane Davis's project with, on, on uh, resilient cities, how proud he was of that project. He supported Margaret Burnham with her project on restitution and how to make things happen. He supported all these academic projects with such amazing pride. Um, I remember how he treasured his staff. He and Michelle and I would talk about who to invite for star forums, and he would look at, he would listen to each of us equally. It wasn't just him grandstanding ever. It was always open to other people's ideas. I remember how he studied those who no one else studied, both the people in the actual room when big decisions were made, being made in the Cuban Missile Crisis, in Iran, in Iraq, and he studied those who died the deaths of others, the deaths of civilians, and he looked for their voices. He looked for what they brought, what they meant. I remember how he would meet with me no matter what at any time. Um, I would text him and say, can we have our lunch? And he would say, yes. And then when we met, he would start by saying, well, so what are you up to? What's happening? And I would look at those horn-rimmed glasses of his and those warm eyes and I would feel his incredible affection, not just for me, but for humanity. I'm sure that John had many closer friends than I, ones he saw more often, ones he knew more intimately, but I loved him and he loved me and that's the way he was. He treasured every single faculty member, every single staff member, every single person he worked with, every single person he met on a campus. Um, you didn't have to be his closest friend to be deeply valued and respected, to feel treasured, to look forward to every visit to his warm cave office and to the lunches at the Black Sheep. Well, he would say, and we would begin. Thank you, Dick, and thank you, Michelle, for giving the opportunity to say a few remarks. John was a remarkable colleague, mentor, and a constant supporter, and a good friend to me. We met more than 16 years ago. It was probably two years after he came to MIT, eventually collaborating primarily on two projects. Uh, one was the US-Iran Relations Project, and uh, the Human Cost of War website. You've heard about these projects. It was not only a highly exciting intellectual journey that John generously offered to my team and me over all these years, he was equally deeply uh, and generously um, uh, engaged in the often challenging discourse on bridging disciplinary boundaries 
which in turn led my students and myself to consider new and previously unknown perspectives. At the same time, John was also a very careful listener. Uh, that brought my students and, and uh, myself uh, to, uh, now I lost my uh, place here, uh, and to uh, new and, uh, insights and, and gave always a wonderful feedback in his typical calm and modest manner. I remember the many meetings we had with John and my team in the lab. John always insisted in coming over to our place in Building 16, and the inspiring conversations we had about the U.S.-Iran relations, his thoughts on how scholars in international studies could profit from a digital research platform, and also how engaged he was in discussing what digital technologies could offer for research and teaching. The insights that he gave us on the history and politics between the US and Iran were, despite their complexities, always highly enlightening. And it was more the norm than the exception that a one-hour meeting turned into two hours, simply because of his clear and engaging way to take us along and to share his thought process, deep knowledge, and interpretations of the latest political developments in Iran, the US, and the relationship between the two countries. We were impressed how deeply John cared about and believed in the joint development of the digital platform and the related work that we did together, and how it was the potential, uh, and, it's how it, and how it had the potential to change research and education in political science and even on the high school uh, level. Uh, and in this context, he often cited his daughter uh, you know, and what he learned from her from uh, high school at that time. And after each meeting, uh, my team were all fascinated and continued to discuss political and software development issues amongst each other long after he had already left the meeting. John inspired the whole team to create a novel scholarly digital platform that had the goal of fully supporting our model scholarly user, John. I still remember when John and I met for the first time in the summer of 2006. We were brought together by a joint colleague who thought our respective work areas could productively complement each other. At that time, I directed a lab in, the, in an area that is now known as digital humanities and I showed him a number of digital project platforms and tools that we had developed uh, primarily for the humanities. The next day, I got an email from him, and I'd like to quote from this email as I think it shows John's curiosity, modesty, but also his vision for collaboration. I quote, I was duly impressed. I'm still wrapping my feeble imagination around how CIS could take advantage of HyperStudio, that was the name of my lab, and perhaps another conversation with you uh, would help me do that." End of quote. In a way, his email set the tone for our collaboration throughout these years, which turned into a wonderful and eventful journey together, uh, which ended abruptly much too soon this summer. In all those years, John also became a true friend and an encouraging mentor whose experience and support was particularly critical in dealing with the intricacies of MIT's departmental politics and funding processes. He cared deeply about including all members of the team so that no one felt being left out. It was a remarkable and fun experience traveling with him to the various critical oral history conferences. We heard about Bellagio, there were other ones. Uh, besides leading uh, the meetings, uh, and we heard about that as well, with colleagues in a very calm and modest manner, it was a pleasure to hear his many stories that he recounted from uh, earlier conferences, for example, about the Cuban Missile Crisis Conference in Cuba and his interactions with Fidel Castro and many other uh, equally exciting ones. I will always remember his modesty, calmness, and reliability. 
He was a great inspiration on many levels, and I feel honored to have had the chance to work with John over so many years. Thank you, John. Well, thank you, everyone, uh, for attending this service, and, and thanks very much to John's friends and colleagues for sharing in sometimes the most touching ways possible um, uh, the ways in which John touched their lives. I'd like to invite, at this point, everyone uh, to, uh, to join us for a reception where we can continue to share stories about John. We don't have to tell lies. It's, it's not that we all went fishing together. Um, but uh, we'll do this across the way, uh, share memories of John in a more informal setting. Uh, there'll be plenty of refreshments, more music from our cellist, McKinley James, thank you very much, and from our pianist, Andrew Barnwell, uh, and a multimedia presentation that highlights many of Japan's, uh, many of Japan's. <laughs> That's a keeper. Uh, many of John's, uh, <laughs> Oh my goodness, um, accomplishments and activities. Um, I'd also like to express gratitude on behalf of the center uh, to those of you who shared your memories and your photos with us. Um, and a special thanks to Nikki Tierman, to John's daughter Coco here, uh, and other family and friends who contributed to the slideshow uh, that'll be shown at the reception. Uh, finally, a, a very special thank you is owed to Michelle English. Uh, she's already been thanked a half dozen times and that's not enough. Uh, for her hard work in designing and coordinating the event, and also to Sabina Van Mel for her work behind the scenes. Um, the re this reception is just a few short steps, a minute or two walk across the, uh, across the, the quad over here, uh, but there are maps for you. We just follow the, the crowd, but there are maps for you in the foyer here, um, should you need them. And again, thank you all very much for coming, and I hope to have you reconvene with us across the way. Thanks.